Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this online workshop titled Funding Opportunities for the San Joaquin Valley. My name is Shawnee Alford, and I'm with the Local Government Commission. We have the exciting opportunity to partner with the California Urban Forest Council on hosting this timely online workshop thanks to funding provided by the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. This online workshop is the second in a series of online workshops that we have rolled out this month in anticipation for the 2015 CAL FIRE Urban and Community Forestry Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund Grant. Our goal with this with these online workshops is to provide meaningful information to local governments and disadvantaged communities in the San Joaquin Valley who are seeking to gain a better understanding of the available funding, the tools that are available to assist local governments with preparing for the grants, and additional technical assistance support that is available. Our dynamic team consists of staff from the California Urban Forest Council, the Local Government Commission, including three talented members from the Civic Spark AmeriCorps program team located in the San Joaquin Valley. You will be hearing from one of our Civic Spark members shortly, but before we get started, I would like to go over a few logistics. Everyone will be muted except for the person speaking. Due to the large number of participants, we ask that you type your questions or, ans or comments in the question box. We will be summarizing those questions during the Q&A portion following the presentations. Any of the questions we don't get to, we'll ask the presenters to respond to after the online workshop, and we will make the responses available on our website. So now we are excited to be joined by our two speakers today who will be providing us with an in-depth overview of the 2015 Urban and Community Forestry Grant Program administered by the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and a brief overview of Cal and Bioscreen 2.0. We will also hear about how communities in the San Joaquin Valley can receive free technical assistance from members of our Studios Park program. And finally, we will have time towards the end to answer your questions. Please note, there has been one slight correction on the agenda. Originally, we were supposed to have Guy Anderson, um, the regional urban forester for the central San Joaquin Valley, to speak about the CAL FIRE grant program, but he was called out on fire duty. So in his place, we have Darla Mills, um, the urban forestry program analyst with CAL FIRE, who will be able to provide us with some great information. So let's go ahead and get started with our first speaker. Um, is Tommy Ta, who is with the AmeriCorps Civic Spark program in the San Joaquin Valley. Tommy received a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences at, Un at the University of California, Riverside, and a master's degree at Chaplin University in the same discipline. With an interest in sustainability, Tommy hopes to bring his skills and knowledge to help the San Joaquin Valley deal with some of the challenges that they face. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tommy to talk a little bit about Cal Enviro Screen 2.0 as well as the Civic Spark program. Tommy? Thank you, Shawnee. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all having a splendid start to your week. My name is Tommy Ta, and I am an AmeriCorps Civic Spark member of the Local Government Commission serving the San Joaquin Valley. For my presentation today, I will be going over what Cal Enviro Screen Tool 2.0 is and how to use Cal Enviro Screen and why Cal Enviro Screen is important for Cal Fire Urban Forestry grants. But before I delve into the Cal Enviro, Cal Enviro Screen topic, I wanted to quickly introduce what the Civic and AmeriCorps Civic Spark program is and how my team members and I can be a resource to you all. Next, next slide, please. Civic Spark is Governor Brown's initiative to get highly motivated young professionals with four-year college degrees embedded within local government jurisdictions across nine regions of California, working on environmental-related issues that are common across California, such as drought, energy efficiency, greenhouse gas reductions, et cetera. Civic Spark is an AmeriCorps 11 month term program, with this being the first year of three years program 
and Civic Spark is administered by the Local Government Commission. Next slide, please. So how can we be a service to you? Among the different projects that the San Joaquin Valley Civic Spark members are working on, the three team members, like Shani mentioned, are working on the Cal Fire Urban Forestry Project. Our team's main focus is to provide technical support to agencies and local government jurisdictions planning to apply for this year's cycle of CAL FIRE grants. By AmeriCorps regulations, our team is not permitted to write the grants for you. However, we can provide support in other ways, whether it be reviewing your CAL FIRE grant application, reviewing existing inventories, policies, and plans, or providing you with resources to make your grant application as competitive as possible. Working with the Local Government Commission and California Urban Forestry Council, the San Joaquin Valley Civic Sparks goal is to maximize the number of state dollars that would be invested in the San Joaquin Valley. Next slide, please. Moving on to the main topic of my presentation, I want to briefly explain what the Cal Enviro Screen 2.0 tool is and how Cal Enviro Screen can be a useful resources, resource for jurisdictions planning to apply for Cal Fire Urban Forestry grants or any grants of that matter that is a part of the Cap and Trade Program GHG Reduction Funds. The California Communities Environmental Health Screening Tool, or Cal Enviro Screen for short, was created by California Environmental Protection Agency, Cal EPA, and administered by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. Cal Enviro Screen is a screening tool used to identify disadvantaged communities, which is designated by the top 25% of census tracts burdened with multiple sources of pollution. It is important to identify if your prospective projects are located in a disadvantaged community because with the passing of Senate Bill SB 535, or 535, I'm sorry, not only does a grant application have to show substantive GHG reductions, but 25% of all GHG reduction funds must go to proceeds that benefit disadvantaged communities. 10% of all prospective projects must be located within a disadvantaged community as well. For 2014-2015, there was $832 million of the cap and trade program that went towards the GHG reduction and 200 plus million of those dollars must go to projects in disadvantaged communities. That's what is that's why it's really important to determine if your prospective project is in a dis is in a disadvantaged community or not, because that will make your grant application more competitive. Next slide please. So how do you access the Cal Enviro screen tool exactly? The way, the, the way I find easiest to do this is by simply searching Cal Enviro Screen in the Google search. And the first search that you get, uh, which will take you to the Office of what is it, Environmental Health Hazards Assessment website, uh, with the link that I uh, put below. And when you scroll down the page, uh, you will see two blue circle indicators, one for all maps and one for a mobile map. When you click on the all maps link, it will take you to the Cal Enviro Screen Tool web page. Once you're on the web page, the, you'll see the interactive map of the Cal Enviro Screen. And brief description on the left, which tells you how to use the map and where the scores came from. And just to briefly mention, the Cal Enviro Screen scores were determined by 12 pollution indicators and seven 
population characteristics scores and these 19 scores through a math through a calculation uh, ultimately determine each census tract cholera and viral screen score when you type in uh, an address on or a city or a county on the search menu it will take you to it will zoom into that area and when you click on each census tract you will get a comprehensive report which shows all the scores of that census tract how they were and how and ultimately your cholera and viral screen score next slide please Serving uh, for the San Joaquin Valley, our Civic Spark team uh, goal is to help prospective grant applicants um, get as, me as much funding uh, as they can for for the San Joaquin Valley region. And it's important to note that a majority of the high, the top 25 census tract, or 75% and higher. Majority of those census tracts are located within the San Joaquin Valley, as you can see from the map here, which makes it that San Joaquin Valley is prime location for CAL FIRE grant applications because there is a lot of disadvantaged communities in the San Joaquin Valley, which would make um, for your grant applications in the valley to be highly competitive. Next slide, please. So just some brief summary of uh, Cal Fire Grants and how Cal and Viral Screen relates to it. Cal Fire, California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, Cal Fire, set aside funds for grants focusing on green innovations, urban forestry and or green greening project to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In order to in order to be eligible for Cal Fire Urban Forestry Grants, the prospective grant applicant must have at least one census tract that is designated within a, that is designated within a disadvantaged community. And you will determine that by using Cal Virus Read Tool to see if your if your project is in a census tract that is in the top 25%. And grant applicants with many census tracts in the top 25% will be more competitive for CAL FIRE grants than those with only one or, or fewer uh, top 25 census tracts. Next slide, please. As you can, just, as you can see here, uh, this picture shows our amazing team at one of our urban forestry networking events and although the contact is kind of hard to read I apologize for that you can find my name and email and phone number here and we would love to network and community talk with you when you are ready uh, to apply for your Cal Fire urban forestry grants and assist you in any way we can to help make your grant as competitive as possible Thank you so much for your time, and that's all I have. Thank you, Tommy, for that great information um, that you provided about the uh, Cal and Bio screen, and especially about the great opportunity to utilize the Civic Spark program to help support local governments and communities in the San Joaquin Valley in preparation for this grant program. So thank you for that information. Um, and again, we'll be providing some uh, contact information from those that couldn't see Tommy's information. Uh, we'll have it uh, on a slide towards the end of the workshop. So you'll be able to know exactly who you could contact uh, for more information about any technical assistance support that you may, um, may need. So next up, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our second speaker. Uh, Darla Mills. 
She is the Urban Forestry Program Analyst with the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. She was previously the Regional Urban Forester for the Central San Joaquin Valley and Central Coast. She has been in the Urban Forestry Program since 2001 and with CAL FIRE since 1987. Darla has a Bachelor of Science in Forestry from Northern Arizona University, Flagstaff, Arizona. Now I will turn it over for Darla to give us some great information about this program. Darla? Thank you, Shawnee. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today, and we hope to be able to provide you with enough, enough information that will assist you in applying for and being successful in the CAL FIRE Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund grants, or as we kind of call them, you know, all, all governments have their acronyms. We call it the GGRF Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Next slide, please. The first uh, major requirement for the slide or for the grants is that you have to be in or serve a disadvantaged community or a DAC. And that's what Tommy was talking about, determined by the Cal Enviro screen. You have to be located in or immediately adjacent to an urban area or an urban cluster as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau. And there is the link to the U.S. Census Bureau where you can get the data and the definition for what an urban area or an urban cluster is. Um, last year's cycle, all of our grants, it was determined by Cal EPA that all of the grants had to go to the disadvantaged communities and that they were had to be within the top 25%. So that was, you know, 75 to 95, uh, 75 to 100 percent ranking of those 17 or 19 uh, points that uh, Tommy mentioned that they used for the indicators, the environmental justice indicators. Uh, next map, please. We'll actually show you your next slide, please. We'll show you just kind of a map of just the central coast and part of the Southern California area. And like Tommy had indicated, it, it's going to show you that almost every single community in the central San Joaquin Valley is eligible for one of these grants and would do really well uh, if they received one. It would really help the Central Valley. So that's what we're here to do is to help get more money into that Central Valley. Definitely would get a big lion's share of the funds. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the second major requirement is that the project has to demonstrate it will achieve and maintain a net reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. You know, we receive funding from the GGRF, so it only stands to reason that there's going to have to be some kind of a, a net reduction in, you know, in, in lowering emissions. So it's based on 40 years of data. That's what when you go to calculate your greenhouse gas, and we'll talk about that on the next slide, uh, methodology and stuff. But when you talk about it, it's based on a 40-year cycle, so, and it has to be showed in metric tons. So you can take your, you know, what you'll have to do on the concept proposal that you'll fill out if you attempt to, you know, go forward with this, is that you will fill out and you'll be asked to show if you're planting trees or there's a tree component, you'll show, it'll show that you have to put uh, com the carbon sequestered by the uh, CO2 sequestered by the trees, the amount that the project, the emissions that the project has because almost every project has emissions, whether it's you know driving the truck out to plant the trees or whatever, but there's always emissions. And so then you will take the forecasted avoided emissions and you subtract the emissions from the project to get your net emissions. And as long as it's bigger, you're good to go with your project. And of course, the more emissions that you can avoid, the net emissions that you can avoid, your project's going to be a little more competitive and a little more successful. Next slide, please. One thing I do want to mention also is that projects that do not immediately result in a greenhouse gas emission benefit have to be sustained until they do reach that gas benefit, the GHG emissions benefit, and then they have to be sustained for an additional 10 years. So if it takes you two years to get to the, um, to be able to sustain it, you have to go for 10 years after that. So that would be like a 12-year cycle that you would have to uh, sustained to show that you guys have reached the 10 years and that, you know, you've reached the emissions. The projected, um, okay, like, oh, min, okay, I'm sorry, this is somebody else's project. <laughs> let 
somebody else's PowerPoint, and I'm just I'm just kind of trying to catch up with it here. Um, Forty year minimum, and then um, display the metric tons, like I just said. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you're going to show both your project emissions and avoided, then you subtract, like I just mentioned. And there's an example on page 20 of the procedural guide, which is currently last year's procedural guide that's on our website. But if you wanted to, if you're interested in it and you're seriously considering applying for one of our grants, I would recommend that you take a look to kind of familiarize yourself with what we'll, we would be asking for. I don't, rec I don't see anything major changing in the procedural guide. I haven't heard anything yet that is going to change. So take a look at it and see. It'll talk about how to follow your methodology and how to, how to do your reporting, because there is a reporting and a tracking component in this. And those, those costs are covered if you're thinking, if, you're, if that's already kind of running around in your brain. So you, like, again, like I said before, you just have to make sure that you have a, an avoided net emission that's larger than what the project emits. You can find the procedural guide at www.fire forward slash programs, forward slash resource management, forward slash urban forestry, forward slash procedural guide. Next slide, please. There we go. No, he <laughs> isn't. Sorry. Okay, there are five grant funding categories. The first one is the Green Trees for the Golden State, which is just a straight tree planting grant. Second category is urban forest management for greenhouse gas reduction. Urban wood and biomass utilization is the third category. Fourth category is woods in the neighborhood. And the last category is green innovation. Okay, next slide, please. The green trees for the Golden State, like I said, is just a um, just a regular tree planting. Now, for those of you that are familiar with any of the CAL FIRE grants, urban forestry grants, the grants that you've had, if you've had one before with us, you'll notice that there are two categories missing. One's education, and the other one is inventories, and those are for two specific. We have hopefully incorporated, hopefully we've changed the grants enough that we've incorporated education and the inventories into the other cap, into the five categories that we have here. And one of the way that we did that was we've increased the amount of money that we can put toward education for um, each grant type. So it lasts in all previous cycles, it's been 10%. Well, we've been able to actually increase it to 20% so that we can get a good educational component and hopefully cover what we were doing with educational uh, grants in the past. So this is an urban tree planting project and tree establishment. We are able to fund, this is a new thing, and a lot of people have been kind of excited about this. We are able to, to fund establishment of trees up to two maintenance cycles. You have to discuss that and show the costs of that, though, in the, at the concept proposal. So because we're, we consider the establishment of the project, of the trees, as part of the project cost. So it has to be asked for up front. You have to include that in your, uh, in your budget when you're putting your concept proposal together. And we're really kind of excited about that. Some of the cities and uh, counties and special districts that we've dealt with and have talked to are really kind of liking that because, you know, in the past eight years we've had a lot of um, downturns in the economies and it uh, seems to me that the tree planting and the tree maintenance crews are usually the first couple that first couple of programs that get flashed when cities and counties and have their start having uh, envir uh, fiscal uh, constraints and problems. Okay, next slide please. The urban management for the greenhouse gas reduction, this is specifically for local governments, cities and counties or and special districts and special districts include um, but not limited to like school districts, flood control districts, um, municipal utility districts, um, things like that. Anything that's not in, you know, special districts that have their own boards and do their own fees and things like that. So it is to establish ordinances or update existing ordinances, your tree inventories, and that's where we've been able to include the tree inventory category is in this one. Management plans, mapping, and analysis of, of your inventory. And it can't be just specifically an inventory that's uh, difficult for us to sell to 
our control agencies as actually managing for greenhouse gas reduction, but if it's included with perhaps an ordinance update or maybe a brand new ordinance, some smaller communities, you know, want to start want to do an ordinance, and that's like a, that's a first step for them. So an inventory is also a very good first step and a place to kind of pivot from if you're thinking about or attempting to build an urban forestry program in your community. Next slide, please. Urban wood and biomass utilization. This is a brand new category for us. And this is for projects that we're, are going to use the woody biomass for its highest and best use, not just mulch, because that typically isn't the highest or the best use of a tree. Some trees, yes, because some are just straggly and you, there's not much of anything else you could do with them. Um, and you know, we're going to divert it from the urban waste stream, of course, by using it. This could be used for a couple of ideas have been for like um, partnering perhaps the city with a with a education, the county office of education, and maybe setting up a program at the ROP for you know buying some like those portable mills like the wood misers and you know the teaching the children or the kids or the adults, you know, whoever takes the ROP class, teaching them how to mill it, uh, dry it in the portable kilns and then, you know, make it into park benches or, you know, woodworking kind of things like that. I could see cities doing park benches and, you know, bus benches and park tables. And so it's those kinds of things. Maybe a co-gen plant. A lot of opportunity in this urban wood and biomass utilization. It's kind of a new little niche market. And so we're we're hoping to be able to maybe help people explore that market a little bit more and, and help get them moving into getting their wood waste out of the urban waste stream. Now, note that trees cannot be removed specifically for this project to, you know, go directly into just, just to get, do the project. It has to be things, it would have to be trees that you guys are normally, that are normally coming out of your, um, coming out of your cycle of your, you know, your trees, your, your system of trees, whether it be, because they're diseased or they fell or you know something like that. So you can't just take the trees out to get this grant. Next slide, pl next slide, please. Woods in the neighborhood. This is to assist local entities purchase and improve the vacant urban neighborhood properties. Now every city has that one or two vacant lots that seems to collect everybody's washers, dryers, old recliners and couches and old tires. This is to help purchase that. You have to have a willing owner. Cal Fire is not the owner, it's the local entity. So it would be the city or the county. And they have, you know, they would purchase it and then you would do some urban forestry program or project on top of it. So it's not just buying it, but it's all it's you know it's acquiring and then doing a project on it. And some projects that we've seen people submit, uh, community community gardens or community forests, doesn't have to be a pocket park, but it, it could be if you're in an area that doesn't have a park, you know, and it could have meandering, you know, walks through it. I mean, I know city lots aren't usually, aren't very big, but it, it could have a couple of things going on at the same time. So it's kind of an interesting, fun way to kind of express yourself in your city. Next slide, please. Green innovations. This is an infrastructure, green infrastructure project that doesn't really fall within any of the other categories, but it still fits within the scope of the Urban Forestry Act of 1978. And there you'll see the public resources code. That's only about three or four pages. I would highly recommend that you read what the Urban Forestry Act is so that you can see what types of projects. We're looking for projects that are unique and forward thinking. A couple of things that we've done in the past have been like green roofs, green walls. Um, those are the two that come to mind. Some community gardens I think have fallen in there um, when we didn't have something like what's available now with the woods in the neighborhood. But um, forward thinking and unique. Next slide please. So now we're kind of at the concept proposal stage, and the first thing you're going to want to do is download the most current version of the free Adobe Reader. That should help avoid any kind of technical issues when you go to submit your grant, your online application. We do everything electronically unless there's a big, big, unless there's some kind of a big glitch. And 
which leads me to the next thing. Do not wait until the last minute to submit it. Because if there is a glitch electronically with you, um, and you're submitting after 5 o'clock on the day that it's due, guarantee you that you're not going to get your glitch answered because our people will be gone. Um, and, and you, we won't, there, won't be any, there won't be any way for you to call and say, hey, I can't, get it, I can't get it electronically submitted. Can I submit it another way? Because if you do have an issue with submission, you know, we ask that you contact your regional forester. And within the concept proposal, you'll see, based on your city, if, if it's all San Joaquin County, it's going to be Guy Anderson. So the thing you want to do is um, make sure that you know that you can do it. And the new electronic system tells you if you've submitted it, you should get a bounce back that says, hey, thank you for your application. It's been received kind of thing. So we want you to discuss the deliverables, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and what, what's going to come out of it. Because when we have to justify back to the legislature, you know, they like to count widgets. So if it's a tree planting grant, they're going to want to see, oh, we got 5,000 trees in in this, in this grant, or, or we got you know, six miles of green walls, or we've got three lots in Huron, California. Of course, that's probably the whole size of Huron is three lots, but no, I'm just kidding. But it is a small community, so you know they want to see. It's it's the more that they can see, the more we are, the more we can justify when we say, hey, you know, that was really successful. We'd like some more money. It helps us to continue to promote the program, and it helps us to continue to get money for the programs. So in, this, in a tree planting grant, you would include the tree information, the number per species. Um, so like if you wanted to, you know, you're going to plant five different species. You tell, me all, you tell us all the kind of species and the number per tree, the number per species. So like, you know, five species, you're going to plant 1,000 trees however many per species you would want. And we would look at things like, you know, okay, is that an appropriate type of tree? Next slide, please. Oh, I think we missed one. Project. Oh, I'm sorry, background, you're right. Nope, background rationale. I was one ahead. Brief description of the organization and the achievement. So if it's a nonprofit that's applying for it and you're a tree, you're a, a tree based nonprofit, we you know want you to tell us some of the um, projects that you've done and, and the outcome and, and how you've done them. We want a description of your problem, the condition or the situation that this project is specifically going to address and hopefully remedy. Include projects that inc that uh, for public health benefit. So if, uh, you know, a tree planting one, my favorite saying is, you know, or you've seen that saying that says, you know, act globally, you think, local, think globally, act locally. Well, to me, the perfect thing for that is a tree planting project because you're benefiting your community immediately, but you're also, you know, you're also thinking globally by doing that because you're addressing health things. So we want to see how you know, planting a tree or if you're going to do like a cogen benefit or if you're going to do um, a wood mill and a sawmill and you guys are going to build, take your old, your waste product, your waste trees and you're going to put them into benefits. Well, you're saving the landfill because you're reutilizing that wood and you're still sequestering carbon because that tree isn't going into the landfill to just decompose. So it's those types of things that we're looking for. If you live in an area that has high allergens and you're only going to plant non or less allergenic trees, you know, we want to see those kinds of things. Or if you live in a community that has high obesity rates and there's not a lot of shade or parks and you're buying a, a lot and you're converting it to a pocket park, you know, the public health benefit there is that, you know, People are going to get out and go walk. The kids are going to go play in the evenings with their families, those kinds of things. So those are the things that we want to see. We like to explain how there will be multiple benefits to the community. So it could be that, okay, well, they now have a place to go play. You know, they're clean air. Yeah, it, it's, I, I think you guys kind of see where I'm going and what I'm getting at with that. And we want to see partnerships, interagency cooperation. Partnerships to us are very, very important because it does a couple of things. When I've done tree plantings with kids at school, they feel as though they own that tree. 
and they've I've actually had kids come up and tell me later, you know what, we planted that tree last year, and we saw a kid swinging on it, so we went and told him, hey, we planted that tree, don't swing on it, you know, we don't want it to, don't hurt our tree kind of thing. So they take ownership. People take ownership when they get involved, and it helps buy in with the community, it gets support from the community, and then on a bigger benefit is if it's like the tree planting, the city and local governments or the counties, depending on where you you know where you're planting, they buy in, and the party that's responsible for the maintenance really buys in on it. And it just seems to be a real win-win situation for us with partnerships. And we really, really like to see those because those are the most those are the most um, successful projects as far as we're concerned. Okay, next slide, please. So listen and discuss your project objectives. Explain how the objectives are in line with the request for the proposal for each grant type. So you know you're, you may one of the objectives may be to um, plant 500 trees in a brand new sports park because so then the object you would outline them by saying you know well this is in line with the tree planting grant because it's going to plant trees in an area where none exist. It's in a you know a disadvantaged community that doesn't have a lot of play area, that use these types of parks or these types of areas, not only during like a sports complex, you know, it would maybe they use it even when sports aren't going on there. Like a lot of schools I have seen in the Central Valley, they use their playgrounds, their school playgrounds are also part of their parks. So that's kind of what they use them as. And so not only are the kids there playing on the day, but on the weekend they're also at the at the school play yard playing because that's the only place that they have. So that's what we'd like you to do. Draw your line as close as, as best as you can as to how your objectives line out with the project of the grant type that you've selected that you're applying for. Next line, please. These are pretty self-explanatory. Discuss how your project will achieve its objectives, who's going to be involved, uh, your educational component. Like I said, it's now up to 20% instead of 10%. So, you know, maybe now there's a little more money that you could maybe, you know, do a little bit of an educational, um, maybe show them how to plant the trees instead of just saying, okay, everybody come out and do this. Or you can, you know, maybe have somebody come out that's uh, from, a, from a local nursery that talks about maybe roots or, you know, from your public works, whoever your tree planting um, department is in your city or your, or your you know, your county or if you're a nonprofit, you know, you might be able to get somebody to come out and do a little demonstration on root balls and things like that. Because, you know, the root ball is a pretty important part of the tree and, and planting. Discount, discuss how it's going to provide jobs to a community. Um, you may be a conservation corps. You may be a city who contracts with a conservation corps to do the planting. And we all know that, you know, conservation corps are typically at-risk youth and the, by hiring them and or utilizing contracting with the Conservation Corps, you see that they're getting trained for skills in the green industry. And so that's that makes a really good tie. Or maybe you're gonna hire aides to do it and it's you're gonna go to um, maybe a high school that is has a high at risk youth component, you know, a pop population and you might hire the interns as and then that would be a way that you'd be providing jobs. Or you might even be putting more people to work just because you grant with somebody a small landscaper and maybe he has to put on two or three people for the duration of the project and maybe that helps benefit his his personal economy and he's able to keep them on. So discuss your community outreach, how you're going to um, advertise your project, how you're going to get people involved, if you have city, if you're going to have like outreach public meetings, or if you're just going to, you know, put, we've had uh, cities put flyers in their utility buildings so that they know that what they're doing and what's coming up. So those types of things. Some some communities have small newspapers. They can, you know, take a half a page out, out or whatever. And those are, that's, that's a really good example of community outreach. And we'd like you to explain to it how it is and, you know, what you're doing for your community outreach. Next slide, please. Oh, budget, my favorite. <laughs> this is the biggest thing that bothers me the most. Um, when, in, when evaluating the concept proposals, this to me gets more people than anything else. 
it's a cost estimate and we understand that prices change and things happen. But when you ask for a dollar amount, get it as close to what you want as you can because in your concept proposal, as an example, if you ask for $175,000, that's what we're going to pencil you in for is $175,000. So if you're really, really low on your cost estimate, and when you come back to us, if, you're, if your project was successful enough to be asked for a, um, to come back and submit a full application, and you come back with it, it's $250,000 that you want because your estimate was that way off, we're only going to be able to fund you maximum would be at the 175. And at that point in time, um, you might not be, it, it might not be as competitive as it would have been originally. So we just ask that you really make sure that your numbers and that your cost estimate is as close to, you know, right on as possible. List other funding sources if you have um, other grants. Uh, some nonprofits, as an example, get foundation grants or, you know, have other state agency or federal grants that they levy against this. You can do that. Make sure that you list them all. Sometimes it's you just you have general fund operating budget. List that. Explain and justify your budget and your costs. You know, explain why you need 500 little um, irrigation heads, little bubbler emitters. You know, tell us tell us why you need it and what you need it for. And then most of all, make sure that they all total and that the dollar amount that you're requesting in your budget is the same one that's on the front page and every place where it asks for the dollar amount throughout the application. It's really difficult for us to know, okay, well, the budget says this much, but on the front page they're really asking for this. Well, where's the difference coming from or where's it going to, you know? So, and I know that this sounds really ticky-tacky and you guys are probably thinking, oh, come on, who doesn't do that? You'd be surprised. So. It's kind of crazy sometimes, and when you're, especially if you're under the crunch, that's another good reason not to wait till the last minute. Next page, please. Other factors to consider. A project with a clear and concise objective, relative low cost for the deliverables, has a little bit of a better chance of being funded. It was um, when we didn't have to do like the, when we didn't have to do, um, so much of the reporting, it was a little bit easier to, you know, say, you know, big bang for the buck dollars, you know, the more dollars for the smaller amount of money. Um, it was a little bit easier to do that. It's a little cloudy, it's a little cloudier now because of the greenhouse gas reporting uh, portion and the tracking we have to do. But probably generally speaking, it, it will be a little bit more competitive if you have a, a better, you know, lower cost deliverables with, you know, relatively low cost for your deliverables. And then um, Guy put this on when he prepared this, and he says projects requesting maximum amount grant funds will have a less chance of being funded. I'm not exactly, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that it depends on what the project is. So um, if you're going to ask for the maximum amount, I would definitely make sure that you have everything in a row and that you have everything lined out as to why you need that maximum amount. So um, I, I'm going to leave this bullet point in there, but with the caveat that I think it really depends on the grant and, and what the project actually does entail. So with that, we're just going to go ahead and we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> so you have to be a 501 C3. You cannot be any other C subcategory. It has to be 501C3 only to be able to get an urban tree, um, to be able to qualify and to be considered a nonprofit in our world. Viable partnerships. This is a talks about you know a 501 goes and says, hey, you know we propose to the city, let's partner and let's let's plant park park A. And so, you know, that's a good idea and that's a good thing to do. Sometimes the nonprofit doesn't have the capacity to handle the financial or the fiscal stuff of it, but the city could be the fiscal agent, but yet the um, 501 3 c could do all the work. And that's kind of a win-win for both. 
the city doesn't really have to do anything much other than and put the billing package together and send it to us, you know, get all the documents and everything from the 501c3. But then the nonprofit's able to do all the work and kind of get out there. And sometimes nonprofits have an ability to get volunteers together a little bit easier than a city does. And so that works really well. And I, I can think of a couple, um, the Tree Foundation of Kern in Bakersfield has the ability to get volunteers much easier than the city does. So it's a great, it's a great, it's a great match and it's a great mix. Next slide, please. So the city is going to facilitate the permitting process, but the 501c3 is going to partner with the company or another 501c3 that specializes in green industry jobs to do the actual work on the project. That's okay too. The city would be the one that, that you know, it's kind of the opposite. The nonprofit in the last slide we had, the nonprofit was the one that said, "Hey, let's do this." The city, does, the, but in this one, the city says, "Well, you know, let's do this." And goes to maybe a nonprofit they work with a lot, but maybe that first nonprofit doesn't have quite the expertise, but they know they know of another nonprofit that does. They can do that too. Next slide, please. And um, your company or the 50C3 hires unemployed youth, agrees to train and employ them to work on the project. That looks good. That's the uh, that's how you kind of help get the disadvantaged community working again. The 501C3 organization that sponsors the project secures another grant to provide for part-time job training to the unemployed youth during the project implementation fee phase. See, I'm not sure where Guy was going with that, but let me. Um, I don't want to see what secure. So I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that. Hmm. Okay, next slide, please. Common project pitfalls. The concept proposal is not proofread or reviewed. Please proofread and review. High dollar amount serving a very small geographic area. Also, people, hmm, you know, we don't that's not a that's not a very good, that's not a real viable kind of project. And the high dollar amount with a limited number of, del of deliverables. And then I think another big project pitfall is that people fail to ask questions. Um, if you're in the Central Valley, Guy Anderson is your contact. And when it comes to species, uh, that uh, what should or shouldn't be planted, Guy would be the one for you to contact and ask. Uh, a couple of caveats. I'm going to say it again. Do not wait until the last minute to submit. The electronic submission process lets you know if the application was received. It must be received by 11.59 p.m. Cal Fire email system time of the due of the due date. So let's say it's due November 15th. It has to be received by Cal Fire's email system 11.59 or before. So that it concludes my presentation. Any, let's hand it back to Shani. Shani, sorry. Thanks, Darla. That was some great information. And I know we have some questions out there. So I'm going to turn it over now to Elizabeth with the California Urban Forest Council, who is going to be facilitating the question and answer portion. All right. Well, hi, everybody out there. Thank you for attending today. Um, so we do have a few questions, I guess. For Darla, the phone cut out on you a little bit when you were talking about the uh, urban management portion. So could you describe that again a little bit for us? Sure. The um, urban management for the greenhouse gas reduction is for you to plan how you're going to start managing your forest. It includes uh, inventory grants. It's for local governments and special districts only. Nonprofits cannot apply for this or NGOs cannot apply for this. And it's for you to establish ordinances. If you're a small community and you don't have an ordinance yet, but you know you want to go that way, you're, like I said, you're just starting to develop an urban forestry program in your community. So you can establish ordinances. If you have an ordinance that is uh, out of date, you can revise it. It will pay for tree inventories, management plans, mapping and analysis of those management plans and, and, the, and um, of the map. 
it can't do just an inventory. It has to be the inventory has to be coupled with something else. So you might do an inventory and maybe map them and do an analysis of your urban forest that way. Okay. Um, another question is: Will new nonprofit agencies be considered for grants? I don't know why not. I don't. I guess I'm not understanding that question. You do have to be. You do have to have your tax exempt status. So. Um, if you are an eligible 501c3, and if you have capacity or can show that you have capacity to do that, I don't think that being a new nonprofit would prohibit you. Okay. I would think you would have the same amount of opportunity as anybody else would. Okay. Um, another question, is it possible to get feedback on an unsuccessful proposal from the last cycle? Um, you know, we're, um, we're, I would hope so. We are hoping that once we get everything done, and when I say everything, I mean that when we get all of the grant agreements for the 2014-15 cycle that we just finished, I am hoping that we will be able to address those types of things with the people that were unsuccessful. We've been told by um, management at this point that we can only answer certain types of questions. So, and I and I'm not sure that's a new that's new for us for urban forestry because in the past we have, you know, we've sent people comments, the uh, the reviewers comments to help people if they were unsuccessful to help them you know, figure out the best. So that question has to be on a back burner for right now. I can't answer that question. At this point in time, we're not able to, but I don't know that that doesn't mean we can't because we're certainly going to try because we want people to learn from their mistakes and figure out how to better apply and, and become better at it. So I'm, I hope so. I, don't, I can't answer that yet. I don't know. Okay. Um, when will the RFP come out? We are hoping within the next couple of months, we're kind of on the same time frame that we were last year, so we're hoping by, I want to think we had a due date like November 15th or something like that, so we're on schedule to kind of be at the same time frame we were. So start, um, my, my guess is, is that we usually do a big broadcast through our nonprofits and, and people like Cuff and California Relief. Uh, we will probably also include the local government commission this time since We've partnered with them and with CUF for these webinars and the workshops uh, to let you know that it's coming out and when it's out, we'll put it all over our website. So um, I think it'll be pretty. I, it'll be pretty clear when it's available, and <laughs> there'll be a very broad broadcast on when it's coming out, and and it should be within the next couple of months if we're going to be on the same November time frame that we were last year. All right, and then. Someone asked if they'll be able to get a copy of the presentation after the fact. Yes, you will. This is actually going to be posted on the Local Government Commission website. Uh, the session is currently being recorded as well as the PowerPoint presentations, and uh, we will be able to put it on the California Urban Forest Council website as well. You will get links to, the, um, to this session as soon as it is posted online. Let's see. Another question, um, someone asked, what is the website you are referring to? What was it in reference to? I referred to a couple of different websites. Yeah. If it's um, the Cal, um, is it the CAL FIRE website? If it's for the procedural guide? Uh, for the RFP posting. It will be CAL FIRE. Um, and we will also link those to, CUF will have a link, so it will be off of the CUF page also. Um, but it will be it will be the Cal Fire website, and when we announce the request for proposal, uh, it, it those links will all be in there. But it's it's www.fire.ca.gov, and then you look for the program link, and in that you'll click resource management, and then over on the right hand side of our website, the layout at that point. There will be a couple of program, other programs under resource management, and you'll actually see urban forestry. So click on that link, and then up at the top of the urban forestry page, 
there should be a link to click on that will take you to CAL FIRE grants and it will be the greenhouse gas and it will have all five categories listed. It'll, it's, there'll be a quick sheet there, a quick uh, a cheat sheet there as to how much, the, what the minimum and the maximum dollar amounts are for each category. And there should be a link within those if it's like it was last year and I know that John, I don't believe John's planning on changing it. I would have heard something I'm sure by now if he would have, if he's planning on changing it. But there should be a link in each one of those to click on to take you specific to the specific RFP. Okay, and that looks like it for the questions. So, Shawnee, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth, um, and thank you to all of our speakers today who took time out to speak. And thanks to all of you who tuned in today to learn more about the grant program um, as well as um, hearing some more information about technical assistance support that we will be able to provide. We hope that you found it useful. Um, our remaining two online workshops are listed on your screen now. To register for any of those events, please visit the link at the bottom of the screen. And as Elizabeth stated earlier, we will be having all PowerPoints and a recording of the online workshop, of today's online workshop, um, that will be up on our website, the Local Government Commission's website, as well as the California Urban Forest Council's website in the next day or so. And I did want to provide a little bit more information in terms of contact information for everybody, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, if you have any questions, any additional questions in regards to some of the technical assistance support, please feel free to reach out to Elizabeth or myself, and our contact information is there. And if you have any additional questions that are not, have not been answered today, please feel free to send um, me or Elizabeth those questions, and we'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. So thanks to everyone for joining us, and have a good day.